total athlete. He was so fit and so buff and so strong. He had a six pack, he was bodybuilding a little bit, and, um, and he's working on a physical job. He was fit. So then you were called and he was unconscious? He was unconscious at that point and not breathing. L'hypothèse est assez simple. Ça augmente la tension artérielle, ça augmente la fréquence cardiaque, ça perturbe le sommeil et ça joue sur la fonction du cœur. C'est comme l'alcool. Ça tue pas du monde tout le temps, mais on s'en parle dans certaines circonstances. Ça peut tuer du monde. Là, je vais rebrasser à soir. On va pas un petit bête bleu. <rire> Avec... Euh, Qu'est-ce qu'il y a dans ton verre? Euh, un ramen coke. I don't want to see another family live through what my family did. Alors, est-ce qu'on attend qu'il y ait de plus en plus de décès ou est-ce qu'on agit maintenant? The waters of Lac Saint-Pierre may look peaceful, but what they hide is tragic. Before this night, he uh, had been there almost every weekend possible, including when there was still ice on the ground. And uh, yeah, he. He loved that cottage. That cottage is where her son, Zachary Mitchell, spent time with friends in the summer. The lake, about 70 kilometers from Ottawa, was his playground. He used to dive in the water from the balcony whenever he'd come. He'd done that jump no less than 150 times in the past four years. Zachary was 21 years old, full of energy, and in good shape, according to the coroner, who looked at his file. He loved sports. This video, recorded by his friends, shows him at the lake. He was a fish, and he loved jumping, and he loved diving, and he was so good at it. That night, though, he did his usual jump. He dove, came up to the surface, and then sucked back down. He never resurfaced. Heather Mitchell told us what happened and the serious questions the tragedy raised for her. Why did my fish, my little fish, drown? He's such a, a strong swimmer and, and everything, so th there's nothing that made any sense. I needed to know the truth. Pascal Boulet is the coroner who was charged with investigating the death. She was determined to find out what really happened. Zachary drank a bit of alcohol, but to draw a conclusion of death by drowning did not, in her view, reveal the full picture. He was not intoxicated, so I can't say that it's because he was dark. He was not intoxicated. There is a who gave a hand. What happened? He was swimming. He knew the place. He was returned to the surface, so he was not going to fall somewhere. Another city, another story. Jim Shepard's son's death near Toronto also seemed inexplicable when it happened. They bought a memorial tree for him. In front of the memorial tree planted for his 15-year-old son, he remembers how he died suddenly and without warning. Brian Shepard was an athletic teenager. His hockey trophies are still in his bedroom. Like he often did with friends, on January 6, 2008, Brian took part in a paintball tournament. But that day, something went wrong. Uh, they were waiting for the award ceremony and a victory team's dinner when, um, when he collapsed. And then he was taken to hospital? He took to hospital and um, they tried for about, uh, about four hours, but they could not correct the arrhythmia and finally his heart gave up. Jim Shepard doesn't understand how his son died. Three months after his death, he went back to where it happened. I said to the owner, I said, it doesn't make any sense. The only thing in his system was caffeine and he didn't drink caffeine. And that's when he said to me, I thought you knew. And I, I thought you knew what? And the next thing I know, I find out that Red Bull was through that day and handed out samples of energy drinks and that Brian was witnessed taking one of those drinks and drinking it. His son drank Red Bull. For Shepard, that was something new. 
Two stories, one thing in common, energy drinks. During her investigation, the coroner, Pascal Boulet, learned that Zachary Mitchell was seen with that same kind of drink just before he died. He is the only one who came with the Red Bull. They have found four in the poubelle. The taux of caffeine is compatible with the taux that has been consumed. I say that he has at least consumed two. The coroner discovered that Zachary was carrying a gene that predisposes him to a cardiac arrhythmia. Zachary wasn't aware of that. The arrhythmia was triggered when he combined exercise with Red Bull. Toute la preuve appuie le fait que les boissons énergisantes ont quand même contribué. Elles ne sont pas la cause du décès, mais elles ont contribué à une arrhythmie et le fait que Zachary était dans l'eau, ben là, il a sombré et il s'est noyé. I always say that I suspect the energy drink caused my son's death. I can't prove it. But as far as what my heart says, that energy drink was the only thing different that day than any other day of his athletic life. And I think that drink was contributory to my son's death if it wasn't the whole cause. Energy drinks are different from sport drinks, which are electrolyte-rich and rehydrating. They're also different from pre-mixed drinks that combine sugar and high alcohol content. These recently made headlines. Energy drinks are sweet. They contain caffeine and other stimulants like guarana, echinacea, or taurine. That's what Zachary and Brian drank just before they died. Are their stories the exception? Death only happens in extreme cases, but there is growing research on adverse effects linked to these products. David Hammond, a professor and researcher at the University of Waterloo, recently published a study on energy drinks. We found that uh, just about half of anyone who'd ever tried an energy drink uh, reported experiencing an adverse effect. Um, and, you know, they range from mild to serious, uh, you know, things like racing hearts, some people reporting nausea, vomiting. Uh, we had several people report seizures. In Canada, there is no way to know if energy drinks sent people to the hospital. But we've discovered that poison centers keep a register of the calls they receive for adverse effects linked to those products. For the first time, We've gathered the data collected in these calls across the country. Seven provinces answered our questions. Our figures show that each year, more than 100 Canadians call poison centers for cases linked to energy drinks. And since 2012, there were more than 900 calls. C'est certain que les appels au centre anti-poison documentent pas l'ensemble des expositions. Évidemment, faut un nous connaître, puis deux nous appeler, bien évidemment. Est-ce que c'est possible qu'on ait qu'un aperçu de ce qui se passe réellement dans la consommation Oui, c'est possible. Oui. Pour avoir des gens qui ont eu des, des réactions adverses qui nous ont pas contactés, ça c'est tout à fait possible. Oui. In the U.S., the number of emergency room visits linked to energy drinks doubled increasing from 10 to 20,000 between 2007 and 2011. But the cause of these adverse effects remains a mystery. They're in their 20s and in top shape, the kind of people who exercise daily. But in the next few minutes, one of them is about to find out that energy drinks are not as benign as they seem. Jérémy, who's 20, Catherine, 21, and Nicolas, 23, have never had one before. In the next four hours, they will drink one can every hour. Pour eux autres, il y a l'air à boire ça comme un jus. Mais vous, dans votre réseau... Mais non, c'est pas un jus, c'est clair que c'est pas un jus. Dr Paul Poirier et Patrice Brassard did a similar test in 2012 on four subjects. It was preliminary research in order to get further funding. On voulait juste démontrer comment ça marche, puis comment ça perturbe le sommeil, puis comment ça perturbe la variabilité cardiaque, comment le système cardiaque s'ajuste. C'était une étude mécanique 
pour dire, écoutez, là, il faudrait peut-être que ça soit plus surveillé, que ça soit de la yoimbine, que ça soit du ginseng, que ça soit de la gua du guarana, que ça soit de la taurine, je peux vous en nommer une trolley, là. Mais ça, c'est tout des stimulants. Donc, c'est un effet additif ou même multiplicateur à la caféine. C'est cette interaction-là entre les produits ouais. Ouais. qui vous préoccupe. Ben oui, parce que l'interaction, est-ce qu'elle elle, 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 elle additionne ou elle multiplie? Je sais pas. C'est ça qu'on voulait savoir, nous autres. After they drank their first can, the student's blood pressure increased. Catherine feels uneasy. Je sentais que ça remontait un petit peu, là, fait que je me suis levée puis je suis allée boire de l'eau. After two cans, she is still uncomfortable. After the third and fourth can, it just gets worse. Je ne le sais pas. Plus vraiment. Palpitation. Ta sœur, est-ce que ça, qu'est-ce que ça te fait? Comment tu décrirais? Je ne sais pas, on dirait que c'est mon cœur qui squeeze, mais comme vraiment vite. Preliminary results from 2012 reveal the trend. Subjects drank Red Bull and Guru. In both cases, after four drinks, their blood pressure increased and their sleep was disrupted. Trois, quatre, oui, c'est beaucoup, mais c'est quand même pas une quantité industrielle. On voit des résultats, on voit des, des, un effet stimulant qui est quand même euh, important. Donc, si on est prédisposé, bien, il, il s'agit d'avoir une petite étincelle pour, euh, pour toute part. We asked Montreal-based energy drink company Guru to respond. C'est de faire attention de tirer des conclusions sur une étude avec quatre personnes, qui est plus une étude pour confirmer un protocole de recherche dans le but d'obtenir du financement pour faire une autre recherche. Est-ce qu'il y a un potentiel de dangerosité? J'imagine comme euh, n'importe quel, euh, quel ingrédient dans des cas d'abus, je pense qu'il pourrait avoir un, un potentiel de, de danger. Guru wants to set itself apart from rivals with its organic certified drinks. They are not surprised by these results. On ne dit pas qu'un Guru est moins stimulant qu'un Red Bull. On ne dit pas qu'un Guru a moins de caféine qu'un Red Bull. On dit qu'un Guru, c'est beaucoup plus sain pour la santé qu'un Red Bull. Donc, si vous voulez comparer les deux produits, on peut comparer une courte liste de plantes naturelles et bio versus une longue liste d'ingrédients artificiels. Our test subjects drank energy drinks only one time. Dr. Poirier is concerned by people who drink them daily. Nous, on a un cas d'une jeune femme de 26 ans qui s'est ramassée avec un cœur mécanique euh, puis en attente d'une greffe cardiaque parce qu'on va sommer des boissons énergisantes. Bonjour, Jasmine, ça va bien? Her story, which he knows well, made headlines in Quebec City. The young woman was treated by one of Dr. Poirier's colleagues. He says her case shows what can happen when you drink four cans a day, just like in the experiment, but on a daily basis. C'est des constituants avec la caféine puis avec d'autres produits qui peuvent être délétères si c'est pris en trop grande quantité. Qui peuvent être dangereux, direz-vous? Ben, mortels. Je veux dire, la mort, ça euh, peut pas être beaucoup plus grave que ça. Là. À cet âge-là, c'est un an. Well, when Brian died, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know what an energy drink was. Uh, you know, there's something out there that potentially killed my son, and yet I don't know what it is. After his son's death, Jim Shepherds felt he needed to get to the bottom of things. Our children deserve a precautionary approach. He started lobbying politicians and publicizing the dangers associated with energy drinks. I've shared my story about Brian with people, and they say, oh, I tried one of those drinks, and I'll never try it again. And I said, did you report it to Health Canada? And the answer, except for one case, and I'm talking about 30 or 40 people, has been no. As far as, uh, But he did. Jim Shepard reported his son's death to Health Canada, specifying it happened after he had an energy drink. This information became available to all Canadians on a website called Canada Vigilance. From 2003 to 2013, 143 adverse effects, some involving kids as young as eight years old, were made public, including three deaths. So Brian is one of three teenage deaths in Health Canada's database. And I, I think it's very important that that gets documented by anybody How important was it for you? That's called transparency. And it was very transparent in those days. 
there were more reports related to energy drinks than any other, anything else, than all uh, over-the-counter drugs combined, for instance. Um, so it did seem like there was something going on there uh, that required more investigation. That's one of the reasons Health Canada assembled an expert panel in 2010. The final report, which includes 18 recommendations, is unequivocal. They recommend these products be treated like a drug, not as food, meaning they should not be sold over the counter. But the Conservative government did just the opposite. In response to the expert panel, Health Canada did its own study, and the government used that study to justify its position. We reached Samuel Godefroy, the Director General at Health Canada's Food Directorate, by phone. He's also a co-author of the study, and he still believes that it was the right thing to do, despite the adverse effects that were reported. In Ottawa, the decision is widely criticized. Why won't the minister respect these expert guidelines to protect our children's health? Surtout que la ministre euh, de la Santé juge son droit de veto pour aller à l'encontre de la, de la vie de son propre panel d'experts. Bonjour. Êtes-vous Monsieur Marchand? Bien. Today, energy drinks can still be purchased over the counter, and manufacturers are willing to pay to get their drinks big exposure. C'est pourquoi, exemple, Red Bull a leur frigidaire là et ont euh, d'autres choses près du prêt à manger aussi. C'est ce qui impose comme condition pour avoir euh, un, un prix euh, valable sur les, les Red Bull. Since the change in regulations, Health Canada limited the caffeine content to 180 mg a can. It also now requires manufacturers to add warning labels. Nonetheless, sales of energy drinks have only gone up. 2.2 billion cans were sold between 2012 and 2017. Au départ, on n'en avait pas de, de frigidaire comme ça. On avait un, un petit coin euh, plus reculé, un peu. Mais ça a tellement pris d'ampleur au fur et à mesure des années qu'on se doit de, de, de mettre en évidence euh, les produits. But information on health problems linked to energy drinks is not as easily accessible. It's very hard to get. After changes made in 2013, Health Canada stopped publishing adverse effects linked to these products. The industry now has to report them to the government. Let's see what happens with that. How do you so, for that? example, if a Red Bull drinker suffers an adverse effect, they now have to report it to Red Bull. Red Bull must then report it to the government. In other words, they're partly responsible for policing themselves. If you look at the can, there's no website, there's nothing on there. We went along with Jim Shepard as he tried to report his son's death directly to Red Bull. No phone number, no, they just want to do it by email. So there's no name or anything? There's, no, there's nobody you can actually talk to? Not at this point, that's for sure. We ask Canada's biggest manufacturers how many incidents they've reported since 2012. None of them were willing to give us an answer, except Guru. The company says it received only one adverse effect report. Le consommateur se demandait s'il était allergique, qu'il y avait un piquement dans la gorge. C'est pour ça que je suis très, très, très confiant de vous dire que notre produit est sécuritaire. On parle de plus de 100 millions de canettes dans les cinq dernières années. It took Health Canada six months to respond to our questions. From 2012 to 2017, 87 incidents of variable severity were reported. This included four deaths beyond the three that were reported prior to 2012. So, seven deaths in total. Health Canada refused all of our interview requests. It's not because we don't talk about it, there's no problem with it. Yes, it's clear. Parce qu'en parlant aux gens de l'urgence, les gens qui font, les médecins qui font de l'urgence, ils vont vous dire, ça se disparaîtra pas demain matin là. May 23rd, 2019, downtown Montreal. The Red Bull Pit Stop Challenge is in full swing, and passerbys can't miss it. And if you're not familiar with it, it's pure Red Bull. Students at a local university face off in a pit stop simulation. 
There are lots of Red Bull drinkers here. It's very popular on the campus and the company doesn't shy away from distributing free cans. On a très 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 tôt commencé à distribuer le produit sur les campus. Alors c'est comme ça que je l'ai vu la première fois forcément, j'étais sur ces campus là. Professor of marketing Jacques Nantel taught in Vienna, Austria, the place where Red Bull was first sold in 1987. Un party qui tourne autour de la bière, on a tous vu ça au moins une fois dans la vie hein, mais euh, autour d'un produit qui contient pas d'alcool, ça c'était assez euh, Assez, ben en fait, c'était totalement nouveau. Aujourd'hui, est-ce qu'il y a quelque chose que vous pouvez gagner? C'est le finaliste d'aujourd'hui? Je pense qu'on gagne que notre place euh, okay. à la finale. Okay. Et des Red Bull. <rire> Creating big events. It's become a Red Bull specialty. The Austrian business is everywhere. Biking, ski and diving competitions, dance and music festivals, skating races, right up to jumping from space. The recipe is so efficient that it's been copied by the competition. Today, they all sponsor their own events and use them to promote their product. A recent Canadian study showed that 42% of 12 to 14-year-olds believe that these ads targeted people their age or younger. In other words, that type of advertising works on teenagers. C'est sûr que le fait que ça soit un produit qui soit associé à du sport extrême, à des événements extrêmes, qui, qui a un emballage et des couleurs qui sont très, très, très jeunes, euh, du dessin qui est très jeune, ça ne peut pas faire autrement. Là. The author says that companies that use these strategies know exactly what they're doing. I don't believe that adults like myself uh, are riding too many BMX bikes. You know, when I asked one of the representatives for the companies to tell me with a straight face that those ads do not appeal with kids, he had the courage to tell me with a straight face that that wasn't the case. But uh, I think common sense in our research certainly suggests otherwise. And if you say you don't market to under 12, which is far too low, then, um, then do so. Make sure that your market is... For years, Jim Shepard collected examples of children he says were targets of advertising. He relayed his findings to the government, hoping they would act. This was really designed to appeal to kids. So, whether it's intentional or an accident, they're not following the regulations. In Canada, it is forbidden to promote these products to children nor can you claim, implicitly or explicitly, that these drinks improve physical performance. The Quebec Association of Sport Physicians is worried too. It's a product that should not be drunk by the children or the adolescents. And unfortunately, it's the public public, and it's those who drink the most, it's those who are the most sensitive to the effects of nefasts, and in plus, often they drink in a sportive context just of activity. Sportive. Our evidence suggests that there are some things happening out there that I think are against the regulations or at least the principles in the regulations. Back in Montreal at the Pit Stop Challenge, Red Bull made a deal with that local university, the École de Technologie Supérieure. La consommation, on a fixé la consommation juste sur les gens qui participent à l'événement. C'est-à-dire que la consommation de Red Bull pour les donner, on les donne juste aux gens qui participent à l'événement. But when our cameras showed up, Red Bull was not following the rules. The staff freely distributed its products to anyone who wanted it, ignoring the deal they made with the university. Even tourists on the street got some. From Brazil! Okay. We asked Red Bull to explain. But it's not that simple. When we asked Red Bull for an interview, the company told us it had no spokesperson in Canada. La totalité de leurs événements, ce sont leurs événements. C'est leur monde. Alors, chaque élément de leur monde, ils le contrôlent. Okay, we'll turn right, but, uh... 
We couldn't find a Red Bull spokesperson in Montreal, so we went to Toronto, where the company's national headquarters is based. We went with Jim Shepard, who wanted to talk to the company about what happened to his son. On the company's website, there's no phone number or address. Jim wrote an email, but never heard back. This building here would be... That tall one that we're looking at there, right? The glass one? We decided to look Red Bull up online on the Commissioner of Lobbying's website. Okay, so it should be right here. And we even have a number that's behind our streetcar. No. On a commercial street downtown, no signs and no trace whatsoever of Red Bull's presence. Using geo-tracking, our smartphones led us to this parking lot. Bingo. There seems to be... Got it? Oh, okay. Oh, look, it's, it's there. See, I see Red Bull, Red Bull cans. Are you is, guys is with Red, Red Bull? Is Red Bull upstairs or is this? No, it's separate. No, then it's, they actually don't have any signs. You have uh, our door and next door is Red Bull. A worker in a nearby shop pointed us to a nondescript door that we had originally missed. Oh, there it is. It's a big step. There it is. We are clearly in the right place. Hi, yeah, hi. Uh, we're looking for Jill Kenny. Jill Kenny. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. The office is very trendy and very busy. Yeah, thank you. The director of communications came to meet us. Oh, hi, Jill. I'm Julie Dufresne from uh, Radio-Canada. Oh. Uh, you probably got my email from Christina from Montreal this morning. Yeah, she, uh, said she gave me your phone number. Yeah, actually, because uh, we were in Toronto and uh, we actually wanted to meet with someone. She so said... You guys can't film in here. Well, I just wanted to introduce no, you... Can, you have to turn off and you're not allowed to film in. I, I, can, can you have When we showed up and asked hard questions, Red Bull was mostly focused on one thing, avoiding our camera. Why is that? Why, why aren't you accepting any interview, any re request that we did? Or why can't Jim can talk to an actual person when he tries to reach you guys? As Christina mentioned, no one at Red Bull speaks internally. But why? It's a rule that extends. Please turn off the cameras. Okay. If we do turn off the cameras, are you gonna answer our questions? Can. Yes, we will absolutely be able to talk. You can turn off the cameras then. Okay. Here you guys, you guys can come out. Thank you. Tu peux fermer la caméra? The rest of the conversation happened while our camera was turned off. That's what you said. Sounds suitable. So, what did she tell you over there? Because we had to stop recording at some point. Um, well, as far as what she told me, she I could reach out with our reporters and they'd have the discussion with me. Red Bull never got in touch with Jim Shepard. The company also refused our interview requests. It referred all communications to the Canadian Beverage Association, but they too declined our interview request and told us that their members' products are safe. Heather Mitchell didn't feel comfortable contacting Red Bull to report her son's death. Instead, she wrote to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, the CFIA, which is the only way it could be officially reported to the government. I even went to the website to try to report this. I couldn't figure it out. Even though the coroner came to a clear conclusion, CFIA sent her little more than a general statement. The email that I got back was, was rather strange. It addressed me by my first name, it gave me the mission statement of uh, the CFIA, and then it signed their name with a f uh, signed it with a first name. Without w asking you any further question no. about no. what you were re actually reporting, your son's death. No, 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 not even acknowledging my concerns. No acknowledgement whatsoever. So with that information, I thought, okay, they've just brushed me off. For. Uh, an organization that is funded with taxpayers' dollars that has 6,000 inspectors, to not have time to follow up on a report of a death seems deeply problematic to me. 
This is the part where they actually try to figure out who has to do something. Yeah. Bill Jeffrey you know, is a lawyer specializing in food and nutrition yeah. policy. He tried to figure out what happens when the CFIA receives an adverse effect report, like the one Heather Mitchell sent in for Zachary. Just like us, he had to file an access to information request, and he was troubled by what he saw. In an exchange of emails after a reported death, CFIA officials questioned the need to inform Health Canada. It revealed um, what seemed to be a very low level of curiosity and a kind of a, a haste to close files like they were hot potatoes. After a few days of discussions, one official wrote, Comme c'est le fabricant qui doit rapporter tout incident de consommation à Santé Canada dans le cadre d'un rapport annuel, l'Agence canadienne d'inspection des aliments n'a pas besoin de rapporter ces incidents à Santé Canada. In other words, the CFIA and Health Canada are not required to communicate. It just left me wondering, it's a death. Like, wouldn't you want to make sure that Health Canada is aware of this, you know? At the end of prom night, after dancing ends, high school students in Quebec often go to campsites to keep the party going. It's a tradition with only one rule, anything goes. In June 2019, our crew attended one of these parties. Most of the teenagers aren't of legal age to drink alcohol, but it's a special occasion and they want to keep going all night. Finish. <laughs> Pourquoi t'apprends maintenant? Parce que je suis un peu fatigué, là. Hier, j'ai brossé. OK. Là, je vais rebrosser à soir. On va me faire un petit Red Bull. Okay. Avec, euh, qu'est-ce qu'il y a dans ton verre? Euh, un ramen coke. Film. Ça me permet de regarder? Oui, oui, puis. Regarde. OK. On a ah non, juste... un gourou. Deux gourous. Deux gourous. Ça, c'est pour combien de personnes? Euh, une. Ça, c'est ta, ta réserve de la soirée. Ouais, ouais, Alcohol and energy drinks are such a dangerous mix that Health Canada now requires a statement on the label. Do not mix with alcohol. D'après toi, est-ce que genre la moitié du monde en a? Tout le monde en a? Euh, je pense que la moitié en a. Au moins la Au moitié. Au moins la moitié, oui. OK. It's hard to know exactly how energy drinks are consumed. Lots of these post-grad parties take place in Rawdon, a small town near Montreal. Ironically, Rodden is one of 60 municipalities in Quebec that banned energy drinks. But it's mostly a symbolic move. Dans nos édifices municipaux, euh, on n'en a pas. Euh, si on engage quelqu'un, on lui défend d'en vendre. Si euh, on donne une concession à un endroit, il ne peut pas vendre. Ça, c'est clair. Mais ensuite de là, ensuite de ça, qu'est-ce que je peux gérer? Je gère ce que je peux gérer. Là. That doesn't stop convenience or grocery stores from selling them. And there are plenty of customers. C'est quoi, c'est du Monster que t'as acheté? T'en prends-tu souvent? Euh, ouais, au moins trois fois par semaine, là, je dirais. C'est du Red Bull, ça? J'ai qu'un autre, ouais, c'est pas pour moi. Alors, est-ce qu'on attend qu'il y ait de plus en plus de décès ou est-ce qu'on agit maintenant? The industry markets its product around extreme sports events or party scenes the places where these drinks can be deadly. Experts want stricter regulations. Est-ce qu'on demanderait à Monsun de financer la Maison Jean Lapointe? Pense pas, hein? Alors, pourquoi est-ce qu'on permet d'associer un produit qu'on sait qui peut mener à une arythmie dans des pratiques sportives? Ben là, est-ce que c'est seulement les intérêts économiques qui priment? Moi, je me pose la question. C'est sûr que ça s'adresse aux sportifs parce que le marketing est vraiment dirigé vers le sport. Il y a beaucoup d'athlètes qui sont commandités par les boissons énergisantes. En tant que, que médecin qui couvre des athlètes et des compétitions sportives, c'est quelque chose que, qui nous inquiète. On ne veut pas de mort subite, on ne veut pas d'accident tragique. Si vous régulez un produit, part de ça est comment il est promoté et advertisé aux gens. Ça peut influencer qui l'utilise et comment ils l'utilisent. Le Red Bull n'a pas et ne va jamais être marketé aux enfants. Anywhere les gouvernements essayent de ban ou de contrôler les ventes, l'industrie est rapide pour contre-attaquer. Il semble qu'il n'y a pas de raison pour banner ou réduire ou restreindre les drinks énergétiques ou les produits caféinés aux enfants. En 2018, 
the British Parliament held hearings on banning energy drink sales to children under 16. The industry and their experts opposed the ban. They were questioned by MPs. So the question was of whether there are any health benefits from your product for children. Not that I know of, no. Okay. The man you see is an expert hired by Monster. He is with Intertech, a Canadian firm that works for big companies, including, at one time, the tobacco industry. His name even appears in the Monsanto papers. You, if you had a 10-year-old child, would you feel comfortable about them consuming that? Product? Definitely. I can see no problems in consuming an energy drink as opposed to a coffee, as opposed to tea. When I was raised here in the UK, my mother gave me tea from a, from a very early age. In 2010, Canadian politicians began the debate around regulating energy drinks. That year, Intertech lobbied the Canadian government. But nowhere does it say who the firm worked for. Red Bull also lobbied at the time. And since then, the company has kept a cluster of lobbyists they can call on in Ottawa. You could drive a car, but you couldn't buy a, buy a beverage that contains half as much. Also on the front lines, whenever new regulations are proposed, is the Canadian Beverage Association. That there is not a problem with mixing alcohol with energy drinks. When Toronto proposed banning the sale of alcohol and energy drinks, the association opposed it. It does not make sense to duplicate existing regulations enforced by Health Canada around the formulation, labeling and marketing of these products at a municipal level. I once heard from uh, one of our biggest public health units in Canada that when they were looking at rules about separating alcohol and energy drinks being served in the same venue, that they had never been lobbied as strongly as they were by the energy drink companies. So look, they're allowed to do that. They're very good at doing that. I'm here today because uh, I'm concerned about the adverse health effects of the so-called caffeinated energy drinks. Bill Jeffrey advocated for a stricter oversight of the industry, but Health Canada has been slow to respond. I think this is what happens when you have a massive multi-billion dollar industry. Um, there's a lot of re reluctance to, um, you know, buck the system. Um, even if it's causing harm to, to individual humans. And unfortunately, I really do feel that the profits of an industry and the industry influence in making decisions is there today as much as it's ever been. For Jim Shepard, it's too late. He's still convinced that children should not be allowed anywhere near these products. Industry says these drinks aren't for children, they're for adults. Health Canada says they're not for children. So why are we making it so readily available? Seriez-vous d'accord pour qu'on interdise, par exemple, aux mineurs d'en consommer? Si c'est pas bon pour la santé, totalement. Si la réglementation est faite au niveau de la province, beaucoup plus facile à gérer. Beaucoup plus facile à gérer. On n'a pas à gérer ça. Even Guru doesn't oppose a ban for children under 16. Si je vois un jeune de 16 ans qui consomme un gourou par jour, je trouve pas ça scandaleux. Plus jeune que 16 ans, je trouve que c'est inapproprié. Pourquoi? Parce que je pense pas qu'à cet âge-là, on, on a nécessairement la maturité pour prendre les décisions pour soi-même. Many jurisdictions have tried to restrict access, though they're still sold over the counter in 175 countries. That is not a direct correlation between that and whether the product is safe or not. It, it's, it's statistically irrelevant if you don't consider the outcomes of all the, uh, the trips to the emergency, for example. If you don't consider uh, Zachary's death, for example. Alors, je vous pose la question, est-ce que le décès de Zachary Mitchell était évitable? Oui. Je pense que oui. If there's a possibility that something that's freely available in the marketplace is leading to deaths, we should know about it. I think that there is more accidental deaths out there that have not been, been put through the same rigors as I pushed my coroner, my son's coroner, to do, to go through to find out the truth. I think that there's a lot more statistics to be found. As for Heather Mitchell, she hopes that sharing her story 
will change things and lead to more transparency. Zach, she's such a good person. He meant the world to me. At least he will not have died for nothing. His death will have meaning. <laughs>